Section 11 of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Barometer There existed a few years ago, in the Yorkshire Wolds, a state of affairs in which the barometer was more consulted than the Bible, and the only barometer in the district hung in the hall of the vicarage and belonged to the parson, who scanned it daily and out of its abstruse lettering gave no hope to his pining household. The relentless needle stood ever at set fair, and the terrible drought, which had already lasted for six whole weeks, continued. The dreary sheet of sky overhead stretched in its pitiless blueness over the baked brown earth that lay beneath, parched and cracked and yawning for rain. In between the rift, set apart for their habitation, walked sad human beings, sighing and complaining, full of vague physical uneasiness and sense of stress of longing. The church and vicarage of Barmoor, and the few cottages to which it ministered, made the only break in the wilderness of moorland that stretched away for miles to Pickering on the one side and Danby Moor on the other. Three trees grew near the vicarage. The boughs of one hung over the roof of the lean-to and made a landmark over the moor. In the early spring they had been fine bunches of verdure. Now their tattered and disconsolate foliage hung motionless, shrinking day by day into the brown semblance of what were once green leaves. A little beck ran at the bottom of the parson's garden, but it was now all but dry. Everything was dried and wasted, except the heather which sprouted and thickened and browned under the desolating shine of the pitiless sun, while the air above it quivered with refraction. "'The air is dancing!' cried the parson's boys, lying in the thick tufts and looking towards the low ridges that bounded their moor to the north. Later on it grew so hot that the very sun was veiled in mist, and the air did not dance any more, but stood still with weariness. So the children said again. A lighted candle held in the kitchen garden flared straight up like a pillar. The children tried it. They tried everything everything permissible under the strict system of vicarage discipline, to amuse themselves in these days when their elders were too tired and cross to undertake to keep them happy. They wandered about together, their arms heavily linked round each other's shoulders, dragging their feet along the cinder paths in an irritating unison. They stood now, in their baggy little homemade clothes, on the path that led down the kitchen garden, bordered with feeble flowers. It was only bordered, the middle patch of ground was, perforce, devoted to useful vegetable cultivation. The living of Barmore was not a rich living, and the Reverend Matthew Cooper, its incumbent, stood very low in position, birth, and education. His gardener, who was also the sexton, was digging the potatoes for early dinner. He grunted while he dug, and his back was turned to the children, who watched, with a kind of fascination born of ennui, the turn of the fork and the roll of the loose mould and the horny hands that came down every now and then and gathered up the harvest of his toil and flung it into a basket saunders was careless and let several potatoes roll back into the furrow out of the eight or so that each turn of the fork should yield oh saunders look ye've missed one piped the youngest child happen i have master john replied the old man it's over hot to be fashed. The child sighed. Won't it really rain soon, Saunders, dear? he asked wearily. He had heard so much lately of this wonderful rain that was to heal all ills and make the world a pleasant place again. Childlike he had forgotten what rain was like and how he hated it, since it kept him indoors and spoiled his play. Happen it may, happen it mayn't, muttered the old servant sulkily. With a sudden access of spite, he added, "'Didn't the master pray for her to church last Sunday? But some folks has no influence with the Almighty. I'm saying that the Lord ought to do it for his ain sake. The bonny garden's fair perished for the want of a little kindly moisture.' "'I think it will rain soon,' said the youngest child again gravely. In his blue eyes was something of a rapt look of a visionary. "'Well, it doesn't look much like it,' 
grumbled the old fellow, pointing up with his fork to the sky that hung above, a wall of greyness and coming very close to earth somehow. "'What for, sold the drain, thinkest thou?' "'Because it must in the end,' replied the child sturdily. "'It wants to rain so badly. It is like me, when I want to cry and can't. "'Oh, Saunders, there's another potato you've left. What a lot you miss!' "'Gan away, gan away!' said saunders impatiently and let me get done gan away and to hannah he shook his pitchfork at them with playful savagery and they turned away listen willie said the child called john confidentially taking his brother's arm and leading him towards the kitchen a low one-storied outhouse attached to the house overshadowed by the biggest of the elm trees listen willie i think the sky is like a great wall very thick and yet very brittle there's all sorts of queer things going on the other side of it that we can't see tell us said the elder boy dimly interested there's great bulls roaring and sparks flying like in hobby noble's forge and a noise such a noise if there comes a hole in the wall we shall see it his eyes dilated he squeezed his less poetical-minded brother's hand. Hout, said the listener, I don't care for that story much. Let us go in and bide with Hannah a bit. The vicarage rooms were damp and insufficiently lighted, but the vicarage kitchen was bright and pleasant. Hannah's lime and marl floor was freshly washed, her copper vessels as bright as the mirror in Mrs. Cooper's best bedroom but in spite of all these signs of previous activity, the girl herself was sitting in a limp and weary attitude, her knees apart and a great bowl of peas between them, which she was podding for dinner. Her eyes were heavy, her big lump of flaxen hair hung on one side of her head, her clumsy red hands moving among the pods lazily and inattentively. "'Deary me, deary me,' she murmured to herself at short intervals, now, Bairns, she roused herself as the two slunk in. I've not time for none of you. Gone away and play. There's good childer. Don't be cross, Hannah, said the eldest timidly. We've only come in for a sup of milk. The milk is all gone sour, she replied shortly. Ye mun just content yourself with a drink of water from the pump. Now be off with you. She gave the thin, inoffensive house-cat a hoist with her foot, and settled down to her peas again. The pump in the garden had gone dry long since, and Hannah knew it. The water they used in the household, that all the village used, came from one place, the well at the bottom of the village, which had luckily continued its functions in spite of the drought. The children, as Hannah knew well enough, did not really want anything to drink, they wanted nothing but the antidote of human conversation to the restlessness and uneasiness that they shared with Hannah and Saunders, and what their father was apt to call the lower animals. The house-dog was as restless as they, and would neither play with them nor stay quiet in his kennel. The hens fluttered brusquely in the hen-house, and the feverish rushing of wings that went on there made it an unpleasant abiding place for the children. They sometimes amused themselves by going in to hunt for eggs, but they left them alone to-day, and wandered on to the open study window, where the Reverend Matthew Cooper, in hot black clothes, was working at his sermon for next Sunday, putting his hand up to his head every now and again. The two little boys were always somewhat in awe of their stern father, and all they dared do now was to stand and watch him, until the intermittent scraping of their feet on the walk in front of the window roused him from his meditations. He looked up. His brow was pained. "'Well, my laddies, what do you want?' He spoke kindly enough, but his voice dragged with fatigue and oppression. "'Father,' asked the eldest child, "'Father, tell us, why don't they send rain when you pray for it?' "'You had better go and ask your mother.' said the vicar, with the sort of grim humour in which he usually dealt. He was by nature a hard, cold, God-fearing, painstaking, undeveloped man, conscious of having a wife who managed him. "'What about your lessons, Willie? I gave you a chapter to write out. 
Go and do some work if you can't play. But we've got a headache, father. So have I, splitting. Run away now and let me go on with my sermon. I haven't even chosen my text yet. Who doeth great things and unsearchable? Beholdeth, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. He bindeth the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. He destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. If the scourge slay suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. The children left him in desperation, and going down to the bottom of the garden, took off their socks and sat with their feet in the diminished brook. The dog would not come with them, but snapped and growled at John when he tried to make overtures to it. Hannah, who came to look for them to fetch them to early dinner, could not find them, though they were only under the shade of the big rowan bush near the brookhead. But she did not trouble herself to look very far. She herself could not have told you what ailed her. "'I cannot find them, mistress,' she said to their mother, sitting, carving knife in one hand and fork in the other, before the family joint, which Hannah had set before her, previous to going to search for the truants. "'Oh, very well, if they don't choose to come in to their meals.' Mrs. Cooper helped her husband to a plateful, and sent it in to him to his study, which he had intimated he was too busy to leave. She ate a small portion herself, not much. It was too hot to be hungry. She was a hard woman, and the absence of her two little sons did not affect her appetite in the least. The kind-hearted maid gave them what she called a bite and a sup later on, when they came and put their apprehensive heads round the door-cheek. She did not scold them. The youngest boy looked very pale and white, and avoided her eyes. "'Poor bairn,' she said. "'He wants setting up with the sea air.' The two children lay down after they had eaten, and slept on a heap of sacking, very clean and dry, near the woodstack. Their little bedroom was over the kitchen, and easy of access, but very dreary in the daytime because of the huge tree that overshadowed it. Hannah did not think of sending them up there, but flung a sack over their bare legs as they lay, and did not disturb them. As the afternoon wore on to evening, the hush became oppressive. Not a breath. Not a sound of birds twittering, of fowls fluttering. Only the far-away moo of a discontented cow in an outhouse, somewhere in the hills, sounded like a faint trumpet call, and emphasized the stillness. The sky seemed nearer than ever now, and oppressively near, and all-encompassing. As Hannah crossed the yard just before supper to throw a pail of scrapings into the pig trough, she heard a noise. It was not Hodgson's cow. It might have been the grinding of one of Miller Farside's flower wagons on the quartz that sprinkled the road, up there beyond the brow, half a mile away. She did not know what it was, a very faint rumble. She thought no more of it, but as she crossed the courtyard on her way back, something dropped on to the back of her hand, which she could have sworn was a raindrop. The thought passed. Her country mind again was a blank. She gave the boys a shake as she passed in. "'Come now, wake up. Tis supper-time.' The youngest boy stirred and frowned. "'Is it come?' he said. "'The hole in the wall?' "'Whatten hole? Whatten wall? Whatten rubbish is the child talking about?' she said carelessly, brushing the loose straws off his jacket with strong sideways pats, and leading him into the dining-room where supper was spread. Willie, the elder and more prosaic of the two, manifested some interest in the items of the meal. It was beans and bacon and porridge, too solid fare for such a day as this had been. The vicar had finished his sermon and was sitting in his place, as pale as his white tie, but otherwise placable enough. The eldest child went round to his own high chair in silence, but the youngest crossed the room to his mother's side and pulled her by the sleeve. "'What ails ye, laddie?' she asked, not unkindly. "'Will ye give me a kiss, mammy?' he asked shamefacedly, and in a low voice, lest his brother should hear, and taunt him with being a mammy pet. "'What nonsense!' Mrs. Cooper said, with all the helpless shyness of a hard woman. She stooped down and kissed her little appealing son, nevertheless. 
Now sit down and eat your supper quietly. Well, Mr. Cooper, how have you got on with your sermon? Badly, replied her husband. I seem to have such a weight on my brain, an oppression. It is quite dreadful. It is so bad it really can't last. Something must happen. Eat your supper, John, and don't stare. For the youngest child's eyes were constantly fixed on his father, and little questions seemed to be trembling on his lips. He said nothing until supper was over, when he begged his mother to read to them, in which request he was seconded by his elder brother. She got the big family Bible and reverently flirted the pages. "'Read about the Israelites and the plagues of Egypt,' suggested Willie. "'Very well,' the mother said equably. Her day's work was done, she had time now, and was willing to please the children in their own way. "'And Moses stretched forth his rod toward the heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail.' Oh, "'I wish he would,' murmured the vicar. "'And the fire ran along the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt.' She was going on in her monotonous, uneducated voice, when the youngest child suddenly screamed and hid his face in the cushions of the sofa. "'Wished! Wished!' she called out by way of soothing him. "'Why, you silly body! Haven't she heard it all before?' The child continued to sob. His face remained hidden. Sternly, his parent ignored his hysterical outburst. "'How old were the children of Israel?' asked Willie, by way of distracting the attention of his elders from this bad conduct on his brother's part, which would assuredly end in both being sent off to bed. Crying was never allowed. Were they as old as me, or only as old as John? Mrs. Cooper now gave her mind to the destruction of this erroneous impression under which her children had been labouring, and when it was done she raised her voice and called, Hannah! to the maid who was to be heard moving heavily about in the passage. John raised his tear-stained face from the sofa, a wild terror in his eyes. Willie clasped his hands together, and together they pleaded with an unaccountable vehemence. "'Oh, no, no, mother, please, mother, we don't want to go to bed, we can't, we can't!' both wailed. "'And what for no?' asked the mother, raising her strongly marked black eyebrows. Why not to bed to-night, same as other nights? Because, because, oh, mother, because we want another story. We want Abraham and Isaac, pleaded William. It was only an excuse, and the mother knew it. One story is quite enough for one evening, she answered severely, and John did not behave particularly well over that. I won't hear any fond nonsense. Now you just trot along, both of you. You are both as cross and sleepy as you can be bed's the safest place for you her rough soothing was of no value the children's faces as hannah came in were blanched with terror john ran up to the kindly servant maid and hid his face in the folds of her linsey gown i want to speak to you he sobbed no what then my honey said hannah good-humouredly stooping till her smooth head touched his tousled one well as she raised her head did ye ever hear the like? What sets ye askin' that? Mistress, he wants to know if they mayn't creep in aside of father and mother to-night. Please let us, mother, they murmured, almost inaudibly. I never heard anything so fond, exclaimed Mrs. Cooper, laughing grimly. Be off with you both quickly now, and let me hear no more nonsense. We did once, mother. Once? yes when they were mending the roof of your bedroom but the roof's safe and sound over your heads now at any rate why she laughed why when i give you a nice big bed to yourselves should i go and cram my own and the master's with two tiresome children to kick me black and blue before morning what are you afeard of i say but they would own to nothing and averted their eyes a little underswell of sobbing whimpering breaths testified to their distress what's come to the bairns i wonder she was puzzled through her thick mental hide of unsympathy they're as fractious it's this unkid weather sets us all out of our wits it must break said her husband there's no sense in it 
we may have rain to-morrow i forgot to look at the glass as i passed it to-night there may be a change soon nay there must be come here children and say your prayers and let's have no more crying they all at once realized the hopelessness of it all and came meekly to his knee hannah folded her hands and looked on approvingly at the two flaxen heads as in their innocent pretty piping voices they begged blessings on their hardened elders and murmured deep contrition for the sins they had not yet committed they wound up as usual with the prayer lighten our darkness we beseech thee o lord and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night for the love of thine only son our saviour jesus christ amen sadly they rose and kissed their parents who had so carelessly crossed them in their strong instinctive desire and murmured inaudible good nights then hannah taking a little submissive hand of each led them out of the room they went past the weather glass in the hall whose strongly marked signs and signals of change they were too young and hannah too ignorant to understand and walked round by half roofless passages to the kitchen then hannah laughingly propelling mischief in front of her inducted them up the shaky wooden staircase that led into the large room where they always slept brooded over by the enormous overarching elm tree its branches tapping the little skylight pane when it was windy but now they hung still like a drooping banner in a calm i do believe it's that ugly girt tree they're feared of hannah thought to herself during the passage towards their sleeping-place they said nothing but the fingers of the younger child closed and unclosed round the maid's stout thumb and the touch struck her as very cold i'd let you both creep in aside of me she said only i'm that flayed o the mistress she'd find us out as soon as my name is hannah cawthorn she set down the candle on the chest in the long low empty loft room the chest and the bed were almost the only articles of furniture in it the wooden rafters that supported the roof made fanciful bars and arches over the white dimity quilt the bed was large clean and comfortless when the two children had undressed and lain down hannah cawthorn of a gloomy north country turn of mind that ran continually on omens and predestinations could not help thinking how like two corpses laid out they looked lying so straight their little bodies outlined under the quilt their eyes wide open and staring at the roof it made her uncomfortable there's not to be a feared on she thought trying to bring comfort to herself merely for the children were still submissive and past all repining now it's as safe as a church but all the same now shut your eyes she said aloud there's good lads and say gentle jesus till you feel the sleep coming on ye oh you'll sleep fine trust me shall i leave you the light this was a wild stretch of authority she might have lost her place over it she was relieved when they shook their heads and declined it see here she went on producing an apple from her pocket see here ye can munch this atween ye she laid it down on the coverlet but no little hand came forth to take it poor bairns they're sad like eh she's a hard woman is the mistress if they were mine shouldn't i like them to nestle in aside o me this room is fair lonesome naebody could hear them if they were to shrike out what are you looking at my honey she asked john curiously for the child's eyes remained obstinately fixed on the roof as if he saw something there he's looking at the hole in the wall volunteered the eldest boy at last he's shivering hap him up in your arms my bonny bairn that'll soon warm him now i must be going lads good night to you both hesitating reluctant she took up her candle and made a start for the door i don't half like leaving them she murmured as she stole out casting a last look at the two children lying clasped according to her recommendation in each other's arms their faces were hidden in each other's necks their sad apprehensive eyes were closed obediently summoning sleep gently 
snecking the door, she blundered down the rickety staircase and made her way back into the other, safer part of the house. Ignorant, she passed by the mysterious oracle hanging in the hall, unable to read or understand the plain meaning which its hands now bore. Eh, but she's a right hard woman, is the mistress, and master follows her in all things. He'd a let the poor children come in aside him, when they begged and prayed fit to turn a heart of stone. She did not toss on her hard pallet, but lay stupefied in the heavy slumber that was the meed of her arduous existence. Upstairs, in the best bedroom, the Reverend Matthew Cooper slept off his headache. His wife did not drowse, but lay by her husband's side, straight and still, as she had laid down, congratulating herself on the great healing storm that was even now breaking over the vicarage, gloating over its promise of recomfiture and peace. It thundered and lightened for two hours. When morning dawned, the great drought was over, and the air was refreshed. Hannah the maid rose and went about her duties with a light heart, and presently, having started the kitchen fire, called the parson and his wife to resume theirs. When it was time, she pulled her dirty kitchen apron aside, put the kettle where it could not for the moment boil over, and went to call the parson's children. She went up the crooked stair and opened the door gently, not to waken them sudden. The first thing she saw before she screamed was the wide, jagged hole on the rafters above the bed, where they still lay in each other's arms. The lightning that, guided by the tree which hung over the roof, had passed through to the innocent children and dealt them their unearned and undeserved death had not divided them. They were quiet and unchanged in appearance, except for some little blue marks that shot in the forehead of the one and the breast of the other. End of section 11 Section 12 of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Tiger Skin. 1. Tis but a little piece of childhood thrown away. John Ford. She wandered about the wards at the Infants' Hospital, a privileged person, ignored, tolerated, looked on askance by the properly caparisoned, properly certificated, properly trained nurses. She was not a nurse. She was not even a probationer, except by courtesy. She was the daughter of the founder of the hospital, Dr. Emmerich Favarger. She spent many hours there, lounging about, asking irrelevant questions of the nurses and the visiting doctors, getting into the way as only a privileged person can do. She was no good. She could not even amuse a baby, or keep it quiet a moment until expert assistance arrived. She was there, it was understood, because she liked it, because the grey-green walls and absence of decoration were soothing to her, and the rows of white cots in the number of thirty, each with its frontal brass, denoting the name and style of its godparent and pecuniary backer that lined both sides of the room. Her own name, Adelaide Favarger, figured over one little bed, and she was used to take up its puling occupant now and again. She would linger, casting her liquid glances at its chance, constantly varied occupant lying there with some, at least, of the creases of ill-nurture and previous ill-usage smoothed out and eased by the bands of merciful sleep. She was twenty-five years of age, unmarried, motherless, the only daughter of Dr. Favarger. He was old and had grown excessively rich, and had found himself able long since to retire from the activities of the profession. He still had his room in the hospital, lectured there twice a week, and saw foreign doctors, departmental authorities, philanthropists, and other persons who were interested in this particular new departure. This he had inaugurated himself, hoping to see it lead to eugenical cultivation of the uncounted progeny of the struggling, uninstructed masses. 
At home, in the immense wool-gathering house he rented in Portland Place, he had a room, the door of which was kept always closed. Behind this he was understood to be engaged in experiments. He entered it, never from the house, but by a door that gave on a muse at the back. As people said, anything, all sorts of things, might be going on in that house and never be heard of. It was known that Dr. Favarger bred and kept there countless cats. He wrote and commented learnedly on their habits in the monthlies. He was a man who might have been asked out to dinner every night in the year, if he had chosen to let himself figure in the list of society's possible guests, but that he had always refused to do, and his daughter shared his self-imposed solitude. She was not the kind of girl whom hostesses asked out alone, or at a moment's notice to fill up a gap. She had no cordiality, no entrain, no go. She was attractive, but not charming. The image of her father, whose hooked beaky nose she had inherited, together with passionate, regretful eyes that her dead mother had left her. But no restraint was put upon her exercise of hospitality in Portland Place. She could ask anyone she liked to dinner, and she availed herself constantly of the privilege. But the proportion of male guests, who put their knees under the old mahogany dining table and drank her father's old port, which was almost famous, was far in excess of the female. But Adelaide did not object to this proportion. Still, sly, silent with an air of biding her time, at eighteen, by the time she was twenty-five the passion in her eyes was tremendous. She glowed in her dark setting, a meagre Circe, who gathered the ready-made beasts about her, and shook no deterrent wand at them. These were her evenings, smoke of cigars, fumes of liqueurs, conversations of veiled indecency under the guise of scientific discussion, which were led by her father. The cynical, heartless old man, holding forth indifferently, from sheer love of talking, to the audiences of queer, inferior, second-rate men that his daughter provided for him nightly. And for her days, they were mostly spent within the four walls of the abode of sanitation and physical purity that represented the outcome of both their theories of life. Adelaide had no sense of humour, but the cruel old man was apt to say that his daughter was the only microbe in the establishment, that miracle of asepticism. He gave her plenty of pocket money, jibed at her to her friends before her face, but allowed her to do exactly as she liked, with no consideration for her extreme youth and the life she had to live when he was gone, fared contemptuously towards the grave of known finality that awaited him. He had done his best for the world, in the establishment of a higher ideal of infant feeding and early physical culture. He had done well by his daughter. He had fulfilled his duty, as he considered it, towards her mind and body. He had given her the best of educations. She had been to school by the sea as a child, as a girl to college. She had insisted on being highly trained and educated up to the nadir of her powers, and had her views cut and dried at sixteen. Carefully concentrating herself with feverish intentness on efficiency, she had managed to do well in the tripos at Oxford, but her friends said that she had been screwed up to the required pitch by her imperious vanity. The girls of her year, who had come out below her in honours, used to laugh when they met her afterwards in the street. For them she was the crank who had outstripped them, peering, as her habit was, under the hoods of perambulators on her way to lectures on eugenics and baby culture. They had heard all about her desire, nay, her fixed determination, to marry and worthily contribute to the world force in the usual manner. At Somerville Hall she had made no secret of her intention to bear a eugenical child or two, having first selected its father carefully, from a physiological point of view. Oh, yes, she had talked of nothing else at tea-parties and walks, and had bored them so that when she left she had made no harvest of life friends. 
they had tossed their learned young heads and quite expected some day to hear of adelaide farverger in spite of her big talk as the feeble hang-dog mother if a mother at all of one puny infant begotten of nerves and hysteria by the usual self-selecting father that is if any man chose her and this in spite of her wealth they were inclined to doubt she wasn't a girl who appealed to the men that marry they felt that and they were right for men looking at adelaide farverger with the instinctive and unconscious cunning of the male that makes in the long run so surely for what adelaide herself would have called the world purpose were likely to pass her by as sexually ineligible for motherhood socially too she did not appear apt to satisfy their own particular standards of comfort and pleasure though indubitably adelaide would be rich they feared to take a wife out of the dreary ill-managed ill-cleaned house in portland place full of unprobed corners and flights of stairs that seemed to drop you into plumbless depths of scullerydom and basement the hall and dining-room were full of valuable mahogany furniture whose dull unpolished surfaces reflected nothing the drawing-room was spread with rich yellow damask that draped the sofas and chairs and hung as curtains to mask as much scanty light as was willing to filter in through the tall windows that no normal housemaid could reach up to clean no one did clean them the curtains soared out of sight into the dusty ceilings and the chance hand essaying to draw them further apart shook out a dusty flavour that nipped the nostrils and was forthwith obliged to desist adelaide's dinners and she gave a great many of them were ill-cooked scrambling and depressing but the wine dr favarger's own province was excellent he himself would have none of it as soon as the sweets were put on it was the old doctor's custom to rise to stuff his creased napkin into the middle of his plate and to leave the room without comment it was always the same he did not as a rule appear again he disliked the kind of man that his daughter was apt to invite and he had no desire to control her in the matter the men were rather sorry to see him go he was lazy cynical and fascinating there was one of adelaide's men whom he perhaps did not dislike yet although he would not sit out the dinner even for him the only time that wald ensor dined with adelaide he stayed until the coffee and cigarettes were put on perhaps it was because he had himself introduced his daughter to the amiable young man at the children's hospital ensor came to inquire after a child whom he had kindly been instrumental in bringing in it was dying of malnutrition its slum mother stupid underfed and wretched but not vile could not nourish it properly even if she would the image of the tall handsome young fellow with the perishing child in his arms had never left adelaide she had fallen in love with wald ensor and with adelaide to fall in love was to ask to dinner ensor came he was excessively fascinating to adelaide because he was so different from her other young men and especially from the second-rate chelsea artist whom she had asked to make a fourth and whom she already considered a survival from her old days of bad taste ensor's manner was perfection he was shyish grave intent and self-contained talked prettily to her father about his hospital and his cats and respectfully to herself about the subjects in which a young lady should be interested adelaide was not interested but she instinctively forbore to disabuse him she was too young too reckless too much unversed in strategy to conceal the trend of her feelings and directing as she did all her conversation and her eyes towards ensor she seriously alienated the liking of her late friend ally and limner mr wallace marks r i b he bided his time however and as long as dr favarger presided over his own table he listened in a frankly bored manner which contrasted with wald ensor's polite attention 
to talk which he only half approved coming from the lips of this savage irresponsible old savant the indifferent natural guardian of a young girl's delicate morals there is something the old hook-nosed man was saying something to be said for the woman who ill-treats her children adelaide protested conventionally nothing she said my daughter said her father spitefully without looking in her direction wishes to impress you with the fact of her well-known love for babies she does not however really care for them a bit she has never considered these matters scientifically in her life although she's always hanging round the hospital and hindering my young assistants if she had a child she'd neglect it cruelty masked by philanthropy look for it deep it's there his nose appeared cold sharp and ferreting he did not smile ensor shuddered adelaide made a wry face and ensor was sorry for her disproportionately so for she did not really mind being teased by her parent the old man continued on the lines i have been mentioning to you ensor even child murder is excusable obeying as it may be said to do an almost forgotten animal instinct a cat say who by some circumstance or other has been disturbed before parturition and rendered hysterical good lord a hysterical cat ejaculated the bounder dr favarger took no notice of him but continued his sentence will tear or otherwise destroy the progeny that she foresees herself unable to feed or attend to so do unhappy servant girls faced in their hour of trial with the problem of the disposal of illegitimate offspring reserve to themselves the right of destroying what their instinct tells them they will be unable in the future to protect and nourish oh father protested adelaide again and her tone was sincere think of it the tender young life the helpless weakling bone of one's bone flesh of one's flesh motherhood is so sacred it should i think be subsidized by the state a capitation fee for every child then the mother would have the wherewithal to nourish herself properly and maternal feeling would do the rest dr favarger smiled a smile without kindness in it it was his daughter's smile she had that too as well as his nose even then she or you would probably have none of these fine feelings at the moment she has suffered physically she is irresponsible mere brutal selfish instinct dominates her and if she desists if she does make an attempt to salve it she has to watch the hapless infant he sneered through her care surviving but as a hopeless idiot of course he continued i accept cases of mere cruelty such as baby farming if a woman kills or ill-treats the child of another no natural feeling except greed or gain can possibly come into play not even vanity vanity said adelaide yes mother's vanity a huge non-negligible factor in these matters but in most cases it is not necessary to plead it for nature's broad back may easily take the blame and when a woman of our own class maybe is brought before the magistrate and fined or imprisoned because she has taken a rod to the ugly duckling or systematically ill-treated a weakly ungracious child to the point of extinction she might plead that she is only doing what a cat or any other perfectly normal animal does when one of her young is not up to sample and seems obviously degenerate to her keener sense my cat philippa for instance adelaide sneered the bounder fidgeted 
Ensor preserved his attitude of somewhat strained attention. "'Had a fine litter of four the other day. I found one of them, to my uninstructed eye, as healthy as the others, on the cold stone floor for three successive mornings before it died. She had thrown it out of the nest. She had refused to feed it. She had just weeded it out. Why? It was unfit to live, and if you study these trials that come up every now and then, and observe carefully the characteristics of the little victims, as described by the officers of the SPCC, you will see that in most cases these brutalized children are slow, unprepossessing, unpleasant, and sometimes revolting in their habits. They work up through the first few years of infancy, unpetted, neglected, marked down to develop all the successive stages of degeneracy. They are obviously better dead. No pretty, healthy, fetching child, a child like the egregious infant in bubbles, say, ever appears in court on such a plea. There, mother's vanity comes in. He would have continued, but Adelaide, whom this conversation neither pleased nor interested, rose. The bounder heaved an audible sigh of relief. Ensor, though he had been interested, even a little charmed by the old man's manner, could not help deploring that this extremely technical and advanced conversation had not post-dated the young girl's departure. Old Dr. Favarger left the room with Adelaide. He said to her in the hall, before he hobbled away to his own study and sleeping apartment on the ground floor, "'You have picked up a gentleman for once.' She walked on as if he had not spoken. She always made a point of not answering her father when he girded at her. His approval of Ensor, though not unpleasing, was absolutely immaterial to her. She loved him. She meant to have him, through the door of marriage or no— she went upstairs to the drawing-room to await the two men, and flung herself down on the great yellow sofa with the black cushions, too nervous even to smoke. She was convinced, albeit for the twentieth time, that she had found the eugenical father at last. Wald Ensor, the gentleman, according to Dr. Favarger's acceptance, left sitting after an atrocious dinner with a man who could not possibly fulfil the doctor's conditions felt extremely uncomfortable his annoyance grew as his messmate tended to grow familiar in conversation a wretched artist from chelsea self-styled modern with white hair and a dyed moustache to whom the host had not vouchsafed a word at dinner the fine old man had been annoyed by his cockney accent, presumably. He had talked, although she did not listen, psychology with Adelaide, and his pert, underbred voice had broken in all the while through Dr. Favarger's cultivated tones. Now that the host and hostess were gone, this bounder ventured to turn the analytical method on to his hostess herself, and Ensor did not know how to stop him. He fidgeted about on his Spanish leather-covered chair, and made various efforts to do so, but in vain. "'Nice girl, very,' the creature went on. "'With a face like an old master, one of those primitives, don't you know? Lots of drawing about. Pity she's so morbid.' Wald Ensor made a gesture of negation. "'Oh, yes, she is. Talks of nothing but eugenics and so on. Thinks of nothing but the other thing.' It's only a mask with these women, you know. All that rot about childbearing and being subsidized by the state and so on. She's an erotomaniac, that's what she is. Sits about on yellow sofas and asks men to love her. They do that fast enough. She's very good fun. But they don't marry her. Do you know Gertrude? Do you know why they put up with her? She's the cook. Why the dinners here are so confoundedly bad? "'No, I don't, and—' Ensor expostulated. His blood boiled. He didn't think he could stand it any longer. He wanted to throw his glass in the fellow's face. He rose. The other man, nothing abashed, although their conversation had hardly lasted the canonical few minutes, rose, too, saying amiably, "'So let's join our hostess.' 
he continued amiably as they passed out cook's bad but can't be parted with don't you know she's up to games of her own is the fair gertrude they found a baby she'd just had in a dressing-table drawer so adelaide told me while she was sitting time for confidences eh seen my portrait of her in the new they were halfway upstairs by this time the artist opened the drawing-room door and disclosed adelaide sitting as he had predicted on a yellow satin sofa with her head resting on black satin cushions there was room for one man beside her the bounder slipped easily and voluptuously into that place and ensor with a spasm of jealous disgust took an early opportunity of making his adieu and left them he never dined in the house again he could not bring himself to risk meeting men of that stamp yet he pitied her he admired her her great discontented eyes haunted him he felt as if a white planing woman's hand was outstretched to him from out of a weltering sea of bounderism adelaide a lady could not really like that sort of man no for she liked him she wrote continually begging him to accept her hospitality hospitality of all kinds she began to vary skilfully the form of her invitations but he still refused all invitations to meals at her house at last she suggested that if he could not stand her cook he should take her out to dine at some low pot-house so she phrased it he laughed for he knew that if he should succumb to her blandishments he would certainly take her to a decent fairly respectable restaurant he would not pander to her taste for bohemianism but save her from herself and her friends as he thought it over after each fresh invitation a taste for this form of social humanitarianism grew on him he began to fancy the idea of rescuing this really nice girl and taking her to decent places and showing her how a decent man would behave the girl was motherless her father did not pretend to look after her she had a fine generous character was large in her ideas she gave freely and was kind to her own sex and would never go back on any one the disreputable cook now he was sure that in keeping her on poor miss favarger was really undertaking a work of charity the woman had obviously had what is called a misfortune she had possibly gone through what is also called a tragedy adelaide was obviously not the sort of person who would ever cast a human being out of doors under any circumstances whatever especially a woman in the condition in which the cook had presumably found herself lazy preoccupied indifferent she made no excuse for her shameful tolerance and even condescended to discuss the details of it with such worms as ensor's fellow guests of a few weeks ago that was merely an error of taste the result of her unmothered unchaperoned state she was at bottom a really well-bred woman ensor a rover a man who had knocked about the world and yet preserved his vast shyness and a modicum of innocence thought he saw clearly that the time and place were out of joint with adelaide her morals were mediaeval with no present parallel except perhaps one that should be found in the milieu of the south sea islands so he came to invite her to dine with him at prince's and even kettner's and she had tea with him on the slopes in kensington gardens they walked together in hyde park on sundays adelaide protesting vehemently that she hated dressing up and posing as one of the smart set in vain ensor assured her that to mingle casually with the select denomination at church parade was not to be within a hundred miles of being of it that to dine at kettner's with a man alone was sufficiently unconventional adelaide continued to protest to beg him to take her to his flat and to discuss sex questions in a loud voice over restaurant dinner tables she called it eugenics ensor did not really enjoy these discussions the young woman sitting there her elbows on the table her hands propping her hard chin her burning eyes fixed on him made it almost impossible for him to eat a solid british dinner and keep his british countenance at the same time 
he could stand any amount of talk of this kind from platforms or on the stage with the footlights between him and the exponents of the new feeling the new world movement the new morality here under the shaded red lights with discreet foreign waiters gliding about the chance commensals the face-to-face -face discussion of such topics outraged his simple sensitiveness and ordinary sense of decency the only thing that at all saved the situation was the girl's astonishing absence of self-consciousness she talked like a boy a clever morbid self-conscious lad just home from college her sedulous use of slang helped the impression yet all the while her eyes belied her and occasionally her voice now and then an outrageous note of sex bitterness pierced through her level lazy accents and brought their talk home with a rush from the plane of impersonality with adelaide it was when her eyes ceased to look passionate and eager but became sombre and heavy instead it was when her sharp grating voice grew soft and mellow and trailing that ensor feared her most and such moments were growing more and more frequent as their meetings went on he stood to his guns however he was not one to throw even a graceless woman over had he not been the most retiring most modest of men he would have realized that adelaide farverger was in love with him he would have disliked he would have refused to realize it for it would have forced him to formulate his own feeling for her and that was a queer mixture of sensual pity and revolting fascination there were times when he thought he fully grasped what she wanted of him and was glad of her assumption that his refusal to dine with her in portland place represented merely a protest against the inefficiency of her cook this theory which at all times and all seasons she put before him and which she had freely proffered as an explanation for his snubbing of her was a convenience to him since it effectually masked his reluctance to be the father of her eugenical child like her other men friends ensor always saw adelaide farvarger home after their evenings together unlike the others however he always left her punctiliously on the doorstep as soon as her front door answered to her key and the cavernous gulf of the hall swallowed her up no bianca capella business for him she used to tease him about this she used the romantic illustration with a point of bitterness she had now accepted the situation and no longer even asked him to come in her good nights were a miracle of sour brevity and conciseness one night in july they had been to the exhibition together and had sat late listening to the band playing tristan the outdoor performance represented a pale vapid reflection of the original orchestral heat and passion merely but out there in the murky shadow-thridden radiance in the dust-fumed air it was effective adelaide had talked less than usual the summer nights that year were long and clear when rather late they returned to it satiate of romance great wide portland place seemed to sleep lonely under a norwegian midnight nothing so cold even as a moonbeam shone on its rattled stones and stern house fronts except where a tree in the garden next to adelaide's house hung over her steps on one side and lent it some mystery there was a big party higher up the street and some stationary taxicab stood waiting in the middle of the roadway black vague a file of indistinguishable shapes whence the figure of a man now and then disengaged himself did something to his vehicle and was absorbed into the mass again adelaide had insisted on ensor's dismissing their own cab at oxford circus and together they walked across the broadstone paved expanse the girl held her exiguous skirts tightly round her thin airily poised legs she knew they were fine she knew she had a beautiful figure she gained the broad flat step in front of her door and turned a little sideways to the man who stood waiting for her to effect her entry and bid her a hasty good-bye as usual he was a little bemused by tristan he was looking dreamily back across the street they had just traversed 
and his head full of carefully conceived, adroitly moving harmonies. "'Come in and have a drink?' Adelaide said carelessly, but her voice was rough and throaty. The demand appeared to startle him. He thought he had cured her of all that. Her request was out of all order, and he did not reply at once. She faced him, but did not meet his eyes. "'Why won't you?' she asked peevishly. "'Even if you won't dine. What have I done? Why am I doomed, cursed?' "'Dear Miss Favarger!' "'Miss Favarger be blowed!' she spoke like a schoolgirl. She caught, as a monkey does, at the lapel of his coat, fumbled at it. "'For God's sake,' she said, "'don't insult me so. Come in for a moment.'" End of section 12《セクション・ thirteen of Tales of the Uneasy》by Violet Hunt。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert。The Tiger Skin》Part Two。Wald Ensor came back to his flat in Ebury Street some time in the early piping dawn, and found a cablegram lying in his letter box. It told him of the sudden death of a distant but beloved relation out in California, a man in whose business he had a concern. A day or two later he had arranged his affairs and sailed for the other side. He had found time before he left to forward a bulky package to Miss Adelaide Favarger, containing the skin of a leopard which he had shot himself and of which he had spoken to Adelaide. It went with her somehow, and she had looked flattered when he said so. He had now a very friendly feeling towards her. She seemed to him, on the whole, since their mutual experience, to be a saner, worthier member of the community than before. He did not fancy, when he stepped off this hemisphere, that he was leaving Europe for a very long time. But it was so. He married out in California. He conceived it to be out of pity in some sort an idea of giving a girl, much buffeted by fortune, a home. But as a matter of fact, Adelaide had awakened the zest of the eternal feminine in a man who had imagined himself to be a confirmed bachelor. The girl was saved, domesticated, but Wald Ensor's attempts at civism and paternity were not blessed in the usual way. After they had been married five years, his wife died in giving birth to a child, which died too. Then he drifted, bereft of his casual impetus towards a settled life. His cousin died, leaving him fairly well off. He started several adventures in the world of business, nearly all of which failed, for he had not what is called la main heureuse, with an orange grove that did not pay, left on his hands, and nothing else to speak of, he came back to Europe. Temporarily crippled in his resources, he decided to lie low till matters should have righted themselves. He was too proud to take his place in society and go out while his only dress suit was shiny at the knees. He avoided London. He did, however, call in Portland Place and found new inmates established there, and was told that old Dr. Favarger was dead and Miss Favarger gone no one knew where, and that she had taken the cook with her. It was in Yorkshire on a market day in Beverley that he met Adelaide again. At first sight she seemed very little altered, only he realized that he had always imagined that she was taller. She was walking with her old staccato step that suggested some congenital weakness, such as a slightly stiffened spine, on the rough cobblestones of the market, about and among the pens and improvised folds that prisoned lowing cows and calves and indifferent sullen bulls. She was not alone. Her companion was a beautiful girl of about fifteen, a whole head taller than herself. Perhaps that was why he thought her shrunken? There was about her a slight, countrified air, which differed greatly from the exaggerated, rather meretricious style in which the old Adelaide had been used to make her points and strive to enhance her own peculiar charm. The two women were absorbed, they were leaning on the well-worn wooden rail that served to pen in the unruly cattle, 
and watched with interest and attention the movements of a magnificent young bull which had as nearly as possible succeeded in wrenching his neck free from the clumsy headstall that fixed him to the post his discontented inflamed eyes his stubby determined shoulder the dull passionate intentness on freedom manifested by his attitude seemed to fascinate the elder woman who was expatiating on his beauties to the seemingly less interested spectator beside her nice beast isn't he phyllis she murmured yes but he'll get his head out in about a minute the child said nervously then it will be hell let loose replied the elder woman evidencing a sort of savage enjoyment in the spectacle of the younger one's timidity she continued gloating he'd have the whole place cleared in no time shall we stay and see the racket her hand stole towards the frayed rope no don't undo it addie oh i do believe you're going to do let's go home the child pleaded pettishly and mary must be tired and cold waiting in the car all this time oh damn mary said adelaide who cares for mary but i'm tired and cold too you are come along then my precious at once she turned and faced wald ensor the long last look with which she had enveloped the splendid sullen restless animal had not left her humid eyes quickly she recognized him and righted herself she put up to her eyes with a reminiscence of her town manner a pin's nest that hung round her neck by a chain of antique workmanship and said in her hard voice is that you then a marked hesitation seemed to overcome her she raised her arm that hung languidly down at her side as if to ward off a blow a little collection of parcels she was holding together by a string fell to the ground the child very properly bent to pick them up ensor properly too was about to forestall her but a gesture from adelaide seemed to him to be intended to prevent and forbid him doing so there was an awkward pause then adelaide indicating with her pins nez the stooping figure of the beautiful young girl and looking carefully away pronounced quickly walt my daughter phyllis how do you do said wald ensor formally when with cheeks reddened with stooping the child resumed her upright position she was concerned because one of the parcels was missing perhaps it had rolled under the feet of the bull never mind said her mother fondly there was a loving pride in her voice none of the lowing cows untethered but morally fast anchored to the posts where their calves were firmly bounden their mother-love taken into strict consideration by the cunning drover who relied on it more surely than any rope that was ever spun of hemp could boast a tenderer more maternal solicitude ensor was touched so the restless theoretic adelaide was happy and settled at last her hopes fulfilled her theories carried out phyllis in her bucolic completeness and obvious sterling health was a maternal production to be proud of she had golden hair blue eyes and a complexion of roses and again roses there were hardly any lilies and although she was lovely at fifteen the chances were that she would be rattled at fifty ensor noticed that the bare hand that clutched the wooden rail was unlike her mother's large and heavy she probably had feet to correspond the dark bushy eyebrows which struck a note of savagery in the simple placidly sensuous countenance suggested one coarse progenitor adelaide's was an excessively refined type he surmised that she had in effect succeeded in capturing something in the nature of a prize-fighter for a mate such she had declared was her ambition to do in the old days at any rate something rustic fair and saxon Adelaide released her underlip, which she had drawn in and had bitten till it bled, and spoke quickly with a graceless, oppressive cordiality that reminded Ensor, at that moment, of the first time she had invited him to dinner in Portland Place. In her access of nervous excitement, as of one constantly expecting to be refused, she was exactly the same, uncertain, deprecating, but peremptory. "'Where are you staying, Walt?' 
at the antelope here on business well you can do it from high walls we'll motor you in every day let us go and get your things out of the antelope the car's there waiting for us thank you i hardly think i so ensor was saying at intervals and continued to say he felt annoyed hustled overborne by all the methods of an aggressive overweening personality adelaide's love of domineering had once been modified by youthful languor now her masterfulness was reinforced by physical fitness she had grown out of the delicacy of the young girl and was well a woman to count with he thought of this as he walked behind her and phyllis through the thronging market-place she talked to him over her shoulders hardly listening to his objections they threaded the crowd fusty interested groups were collected round this and that shrewd cheap jack he extolled in the clearings they willingly made for him now yards of tawdry lace now pieces of coarse netting warranted never to tear now rough crockery warranted never to break and ensor could hardly hear adelaide's unmodulated voice through the clatter of hoofs on the stone causeways as the clumsy puzzled animals were run along them at a gallop by sweating panting stable boys anxious to exhibit their paces to intending purchasers adelaide would stop dead every now and then and become absorbed in the contemplation of melancholy stallions with straw-plated tails which stood their shiny black hawks turned outward all adown the smooth bits and stone flagging intersecting the rough cobbles ensor to call her attention to his protests punctuated his remarks at intervals with my dear mrs she took no notice and if she heard did not care to supply the name now and again phyllis would turn and smile a sweet irresponsible smile at him and sketch an inviting gesture ensor liked all children and especially girls of that age and after one of these little demonstrations followed with less travail of the spirit and fewer protests he rather wanted too to see the merry be damned who was said to be waiting cold tired and neglected in the car they had reached the outer fringe of booths the raucous voices of cheap jacks and the heart-rending moos of the cows faded out of hearing and the broad street in front of the antelope inn before whose open yard door many conveyances stood lay before him he crossed the road and was now faced with the immediate problem of acceptance or refusal of adelaide's invitation there was another child in the motor hunched up and cowering among the rolling swathes of the leather motor hood pushed back she was obviously cold and tired of waiting she seemed about ten years old her dull eyes fixed themselves on him stupidly warily with a kind of painful animal interest she did not take them off him her white wide flat face did not light up in the least when adelaide approached and in reply to ensor's tacit inquiry said briefly no not mine the cook's you remember gertrude the cook that couldn't cook ha ha didn't you worry me about it i have mary here for her health and i leave her in the car because she's afraid of cows now phyllis be quick go and get the things at stores and come back it's a fairly long run home walt she busied herself with some rugs phyllis departed saying in a child's flirtatious way as she obeyed her mother's request now mind you come while ensor slavishly entered the hotel sought his room and gathered up his belongings the other child seemed to him to have seconded the invitation too in her own dreamy spiritless way it touched him he fancied he might cheer her up a bit if he could once get her to take to him and gain her confidence children liked him when he came out of the hotel again phyllis and the other child were safely stowed away in the back of the car under one rug pressed up against each other to keep warm they seemed to get on very well together and so was glad to see adelaide invited her guest to take his seat in front beside her and they started adelaide drove in a careless slapdash way which suggested the hand of little practice she took risks she showed ignorance of some fundamental rules of safety this however did not disconcert ensor at all he had plenty of physical courage 
full tilt they ran along dull lanes and roads blackish underfoot hedge bordered in a sullen craven green the plain of york in all its mediocre dreariness unrolled itself before them adelaide from between her pursed lips made no attempt to point out landmarks or objects of interest there were no interesting features to point out dull bryony shoots and clematis tendrils were spread over the hedges like a dusty net coverlet on a lodging-house bed neutral tinted nettles carpeted them at the foot and at due intervals in their extent clean neatly made gates shut off the entry into fields each one like the other the same kind of stupid spiritless bird rose up now and again and lighted on the tedious brown furrow that hid the one behind it mean clumps of trees that veiled no possible trysting place bordered the road or looked over it here and there ensor heard the little girls behind him whispering and chuckling in the well of the carriage where they had declined in laughing avoidance of the cold wind that blew steadily over the plain at least he heard phyllis's voice and took mary's for granted the two seemed to be very good friends and then adelaide began to talk to him in her wire-drawn inartistic tones which suggested to ensor something like a rope lashing being trailed along a gravel walk for he longed to bid her to lift it to try to get taut now and then the crude passion that smouldered in her eyes only lent an edge to her voice it always did when his mind dwelt on the changes in her he could think of no feature that had altered much in twelve years except her mouth which from having been as nearly as possible straight had now lost all suggestion of curve and opening generally in raspishness closed always in a helpless peevishness her face reminded him of the matronly yet at the same time old maidish faces of those mentally starved materially satisfied women of the renaissance he had seen in pictures and reproductions it was the same drawing over the cheeks the same anxious slope of the flesh away from the consumptive peaks and hollows of the bones her nervous little hands claw-like handled the wheel with ill-regulated vigour and obstinate determination to excel her vanity amused ensor and since it made so decidedly for efficiency commended itself to him he liked women to show grit and did not on the whole object to be managed by any person exhibiting marked competency as he reckoned she had to give most of her real attention to the driving of the car her vanity stimulated her to attempt to pay off her guest with a conversation composed of ideas long since formulated by herself or others isn't it a grim country she said cheerfully they say that there are more heirs and heiresses of solitary habit and tottering reason to the square inch here than in any other county in england you see she knitted her brows these old feudal people have all along paid no attention to physiological rules they have chosen to intermarry so fearfully your old preoccupation eh said ensor smiling don't sneer wald we met and took to each other on that ground you remember and i am keener on it than ever i hate anything of a misbegotten or deformed nature like death or sin which indeed it is she looked at him keenly do you know if i was not a christian woman i should find myself beating mary here within an inch of her life ensor made a sound indicating his wish and his conviction that it were proper that she should lower her voice adelaide accepted the criticism and to some extent heeded its remonstrance in the next few words she said but as she's poor faithful old gertrude's unique scion i stay my hand and give her instead parish's food it's very good of you ensor murmured oppressed he remembered the baby in the chest of drawers and besides he felt those big helpless opaque swimming eyes of the child in the car behind plumb in the middle of his back dead against my own theories too adelaide went on that sort of distinct evidence of a parent's physiological failure ought to be stamped out at birth perhaps said ensor slowly and strainedly perhaps she is going to be a poet i fancy keats had those beautiful suffering eyes eyes of a sick monkey pah ejaculated adelaide brutally 
and as loudly as she had ever spoken before. Let us not think of her. Tell me all about yourself. Waldensor obeyed and gave her an account of his doings during the last twelve years. As he talked in that even, rather tame manner, which in him was accentuated, not diminished, by deep feeling, he was conscious all the time of a duel waged within him by two opposing but strong moods. One side of him longed to lay his hand on Adelaide's and get her to stop the car and allow him to step out of the range of her puissant personality, which alarmed while it interested him. The other side, the explorer-adventurer side, divorced from her image, wanted to stay and see it through and have another look at the two youthful beings for whom Adelaide was making herself responsible, more especially the cook's ailing child. One long, attenuated, but distinct thread of passionate feeling linked him to her. He had felt like that towards a monkey from a tropical island on the ship that the captain was bringing home to colder climes, and which resented it in sadness and melancholy. With regard to adventure he could not help wondering if, when they reached a place called High Walls, where Adelaide said she lived, a fond husband would come to the portal and welcome his wife and the stranger she had chosen to bring home. For Adelaide had volunteered no information about herself on that head, and he was too shy, or too apprehensive of difficulties, to ask for any. He only gathered that she was well off and had bought high walls herself, for Dr. Favarger had left his only daughter everything. Ensor expected, he knew not why, that the car would turn in at some majestic drive, bordered by fine old trees. He was the more surprised when, after going for half a mile or so, along a bit of road bordered by hedges on one side, and a high brick wall on the other, overhung by heavy elm trees, Adelaide stopped the car opposite a small, sunk door in this very wall. "'I live here,' she said. "'Wald, will you ring?' Rooks cawed from their nests in the clumps of high trees that seemed to fill all the enclosure, and a dog barked, evidently hearing the noise of the car and anxious to welcome its mistress. Ensor, as he stood in the roadway, after having pulled the long iron handle of the bell, had the sense of being at the postern gate of some embattled fortress, standing tall and grimly self-contained in the gloomy plateau of the wolds. Time passed. No one came to the door. The dog inside barked fitfully. Adelaide's voice sounded unreal in the great spaces, yet she was talking as the people talk in cities. "'Nice old place,' she was saying jauntily. "'I bought it. It went so well with my own peculiar mentality. It belonged to one of the crocky-minded noblemen I told you of. He came to need only one room, somewhere else, and padded, so I got it cheap, freehold and all.' It takes delightfully few servants to keep it up, and that's what I like. I hate servant spying. What are mine about? Hello! She stood up in the car and called out. Her voice was not good. At last a shuffling old man-servant appeared, and stood holding the door, not attempting to make himself useful in any way. It was Ensor who helped Adelaide out. Then he turned to the two children. Phyllis had already leaped out. Ensor looked keenly at the other child, sitting, or rather crouching, in the wide seat. Their eyes met for a moment. Then Adelaide seemed to intercept them. "'Mary, stop in the car!' "'No, she may as well come round with us,' she said fussily. The man got in and took the vehicle off somewhere, and piled with motor rugs, Ensor stumbled after Adelaide and the two children. A narrow path flagged with stones, not a carriage drive, led up the very short way to the house. On the steps an ugly puppy rushed at them and covered Phyllis with damp paw marks. The child tried to abash and quieten it in vain. Adelaide, in her unnatural, would-be forcible tones, called it off and bade it come to her. The dog obeyed, but in Ensor's opinion, without enthusiasm. Adelaide seemed to think differently. "'You see,' she said, "'he loves the hand that chastens him.' I do the chastening. I have to. All these people are so tender-hearted, except Gertrude. She has good strong hands. I do hate to hear it howling, Addie, remarked Phyllis. All young things, said her mother gravely, 
need to go through a period of misery and due correction before they are fitted for social purposes. And this is a good dog, or you bet I shouldn't keep him or trouble about him at all. I hate mongrels, human or otherwise, don't you, Wald? Her eyes hardened, embittered in expression, fell on the puny child, who held an immense rug that trailed on the ground beside her. She was evidently too shy or helpless to put it down or act at all until an order was expressly given her. Ensor took the rug from her. She did not look up. He began to think this instance of Adelaide's philanthropic kindness was half-witted. "'Go in, Mary,' said Adelaide sharply. "'Don't stand fiddling there.' Someone did thrash the puppy the next day, for Ensor heard it howling loudly beneath his bedroom window. Its cry was for all the world like that of a child that was being beaten. He could not rest in bed through the noise though he knew well enough that dogs must be trained. He rose and employed the hour or so thus gained on the day to examine carefully the position of the room he was in, its means of exit, etc., in the style of all well-seasoned travellers. He then put on his hat and went out by a back entrance, half stumbling over and apologising to a small child in a cotton frock who was scrubbing the steps of it. He examined the shape of the house, the extent of the garden, and counted the number of tall elm-trees that surrounded it, and were in their turn circumscribed by the high, dull brick wall that gave Adelaide's house its name. High Walls was a composite building, finished in late Georgian period, but including portions dating from almost every period after Elizabeth. The Elizabethan part was more or less built up in the interior. A Georgian architect of the worst years had carefully enclosed and hidden it away, and faced all with a frontage that offended every canon of art and taste, and depressed every eye as well. The high brick wall, Ensor fancied, represented a still more recent addition, for the hideous, expensive portal and colonnade of the façade, which had been evidently designed to dazzle the countryside, was dwarfed and crushed out of all proportion by the encroaching circumference, which ate up both air and space, and gave the house the air of an asylum or a prison. His voyage of discovery ended, he went quietly in by the front door, in the middle of the colonnade, and found himself in a shiny-floored hall, carpeted here and there with wild beast-skins, among which he recognised his own handsome present to Miss Adelaide Favarger. One corner of the hall, rendered rather dark in daylight by the pillars of the colonnade, was palisaded off with old German screens, or armchairs that successfully fended off draughts from the front door and permitted it to be used as a lounge and smoking room. It was panelled with oak and furnished in the old-fashioned regulation country house style in dark browns and yellows. Several heavy antlered heads of deer hung on the walls. Their sad glassy eyes leered down pensively. He noticed as he went round, pins nez in hand, that there were some very good engravings but they all embodied the usual gloating cruelties of the sportsman. There was a print of the fighting deer of Landseer, with antlers interlocked till death, another of the rabbit in the trap, and one of the stag pulled down by its yelping enemies. All these famous works of art were repugnant to Ensor. He was, if he thought about it, inclined to be anti-vivisectionist. On the broad hearth, although it was July, charred logs rested on the iron dogs and fell slowly away into a bed of soft grey ash the reduced ghosts of themselves there was a growing heap of detritus that was never buried or cleared away the gnawing flame lurked there somewhere at its heart but gave no warmth and the man used to californian summers felt chilly and longed to stir the logs though it was summer into some semblance of wintry activity he knew how to behave, however, and, taking up an out-of-date local paper that was lying about, he sat down with a patient eye on the main staircase, which he expected his hostess to presently descend. The paper was dull to the uninitiated in local gossip, and he dropped it and began to go over again in his mind the last words that Adelaide had said to him as she ascended that very staircase last night. One small, finely shaped foot was on the stair with her small housekeeping letter-bag in one hand, 
the bag he had never seen her without since they came to high walls she had held out to him the other hand saying gravely without suspicion of vulgar archness good night sleep well i shan't he had said nothing disconcerted but had let her go he was outraged not so much by her words as by the look with which she had punctuated them it made him remember with an intense shy conscious memory the last time he had seen her eyes as she had turned to him on the gaslit doorstep the eyes of a sick monkey she had given him the phrase herself the yellow sofa in its corner at portland place the wide gleaming doorstep again when placated reproachless seeking not to blind him she had let him out into the dawn he had begun by admiring her for her fine non-deprecatory attitude her bold reliance on the social and moral efficacy of her own standards and principles she denied nothing deprecated nothing dropped nothing the yellow sofa was there in the hall he had recognized it overnight a handsome piece of furniture he had not supposed that she cared to invest it with sentimental recollections of her old home and her maiden days or did she he brooded over the ways of women of which he proudly supposed himself to know nothing when a female servant came through the outer hall bearing to-day's paper which she laid down on the yellow cushions beside him he had no time to ask her a question as to adelaide's morning plans for she quickly passed back again through the red baize door that led so ensor imagined to the kitchen region she left the door open a waft of sounds came to him voices one of which he fancied was the voice of the famous and omnipotent gertrude on whom so far he had never set eyes while the other he knew to be adelaide's she was already down in a foot then she was a good housekeeper and gave her orders early she was evidently holding the handle of the door preparatory to coming through finishing a sentence which he did not hear the tone in which gertrude permitted herself to answer her mistress set him against her it was raucous coarsely good-humoured and her speech of which he caught fragments here and there grossly familiar with me you've told phyllis well that's quick work i must say it's got to be done adelaide replied sturdily he heard her and the sooner the better the other'll miss her that can't be helped you needn't mind phyllis'll profit this very day mind there was a pause the cook had gone back into the kitchen some little way before she replied and the vicious emphasis with which she spoke was accentuated by the clang of a dish roughly set down on some pantry shelf or other i don't mind but it seems a queer sort of way to go and treat your own flesh and blood adelaide let the door go sharply and bag in hand came forward to greet her guest she had not expected to see him already down and said so she looked excessively handsome if a trifle pale as she pushed her hand through the cloudy swatches of hair that lay across her forehead with characteristic crankiness she arranged her hair across not over or back from her forehead it became her she stood chatting to her guest telling him that breakfast was not ready yet for that lazy little phyllis whose business it was to make the tea had had a fit of temper this morning early and was not dressed yet while she was speaking phyllis looked over the banisters and addressed her mother calling her by her christian name a fashion that ensor disliked he fancied that perhaps the child was allowed nay enjoined to do so in order to minimize the effect of her size and the precocious development on the age estimation of her mother a natural weakness to which adelaide like other ladies was probably prone oh addy the child said appealingly mayn't i really have mary to sleep with me any more no replied adelaide it is high time gertrude began to train her now don't worry it would be poor kindness to keep her any longer with you spoiling a good servant and unfitting her for her situation go in and make tea phyllis obeyed sulkily ensor was glad to see her put up a good fight for her companion 
Adelaide perched with a childish movement on the arm of the sofa, showing a pretty ankle in its open-work stocking. She looked like a handsome, capable gypsy, as she sat there dangling her everlasting bag. "'I've been asking Gertrude,' she said carelessly, "'if she remembers you, and she says she does. You must look her up after breakfast.' "'But I never saw her,' I said, unwillingly remembering her voice so lately heard. "'You must mean your cook in Portland Place?' "'Not much of a cook, was she? "'But so faithful, and I needed it. "'She needed me. "'She had a lover who was a prize-fighter, "'and he deserted her and left her "'with that wretched child you've seen to keep. "'It is a case of stavism, I expect, "'for he was a fine fellow. "'Was that she beating the dog this morning? "'Yes, she's got good strong hands.' "'An exultant gleam.' an instantaneous flicker as though by some new unexpected mode of invention he had been afforded a kodak view of the suddenly protruded forked tongue of a viper crossed ensor's excited vision he shuddered and adelaide suddenly but with an air of intense premeditation slipped off the arm of the sofa and kissed him End of section thirteen.